Welcome to the Work in Progress podcast, where we keep our whip in check. And now here's Michelle, certified coach and founder of Strive Leadership Development. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 59 of the Work in Progress podcast. And today I want to talk to you about a continuation of my last podcast where I was talking about our performance motivators. So if you haven't heard podcast number 58, the one right before now, this is a great time to pause, stop this one, go backwards and go listen to that podcast. It's number 58. It's on our performance motivators. And that is the introduction for where I'm going next, which is this podcast number 59, where we're going to talk about performance motivators, where the definition and how we define that is basically it's an emotional need, drive or desire that fuels us into actions to satisfy that emotional need, drive or desire. So the decisions we're making, the the choices we make in what we purchase, in what we do in our lives, in what motivates us to do this thing, that thing or another thing are all based on our performance motivator. And basically what that means is that it's dependent upon the season of our life that we're in. And that season of our life is what's driving our emotions to then act and create things in our lives in order to satisfy that emotional need or that drive or that desire. And so it's the fuel, it's the fuel behind all of it. And my definition boils down to specifically performance motivators so that we can really understand why a person chooses to work where they work. My entire concept is titled, it's never about the money. And what that means, because many people, when they hear that, they they go crazy and think, no, of course it's about the money. Of course that's the reason we work. Yes, I agree with you 100%. We work to make money. Many of us, not all of us, many of us. And I am not suggesting that we aren't doing that. What I'm suggesting is there are much deeper, much more um, emotionally charged reasons for why we work and why we choose to work where we work. And the best example I can give you is if you have two companies, company A and company B, they're literally side by side, They look on the outside exactly the same. They're the exact same distance from work. The compensation package they offer you is exactly the same. The benefits are exactly the same. There's no difference financially to you and has zero effect on you. No matter which one you choose, you're still going to choose one. You're not gonna just flip a coin. You will choose one and you will choose to stay with that one for reasons that are far more important to you than money. And that's my real suggestion, is that there are reasons you do what you do, there's a reason you get out of bed in the morning, there's a reason you're motivated to go to work there, and that is to satisfy an emotional need that you have that is far more important than the money. We're assuming the money is there, that's a given. And after that, why do you choose what you choose? And so that's what we talked about in the last episode, the last podcast, is we dove into that a little bit and understanding it and kind of the stories that are behind that. And in this podcast, what I wanna dive into with you is talking about the more specific definitions of each of them. Now, why does this even matter? This is probably more important than anything else. Why does it matter? Well, number one, if you're listening to this and you are able to determine what your performance motivator is, then it helps you understand why you're making the decisions you're making. Sometimes we don't even realize the decisions we're making are coming from an emotional place or have taken the time to really investigate why we are leaning one way or another, or why we're staying or why we're wanting to leave. This gives you an opportunity to really see what's causing you to make the decisions that you make. And once you understand that, you can make new decisions. It's not as if you can't change your mind. This isn't like a DNA test where it's in stone. You can certainly make new decisions, but this allows you to understand your decisions. It it helps you understand why you're choosing what you're doing. So that's important for you. 
But then let's take this next level, which is really where I want to go with all of this. And it is probably the most important part in, in, in my work and what I want to do from a leadership development standpoint and creating stronger managers is how can you lead, hire, retain, and motivate your team to the goals that you want to achieve as a company or as a division or as a um, department, whatever it is you manage, how can you create a team that is loyal to you and motivated toward the goals that you have for that team? And this is what I believe allows this. And I believe it because I have created it and done this myself. And it was a little bit by accident with a lot of research too, but I'm telling you, the day you are told, or maybe you'll be told many times by many people that you're an amazing manager and that they really appreciate you and that they love working for you and that you're the best manager you've ever had. When you hear that, you know you're doing something right. You know you've created something special. And that's what I've had the opportunity to do. And that's what I wanna share with you so you can create the same thing because it's quite scientific actually. And it's simple. It's not even hard. It's not complicated at all. So this is available to you right now. So what I would encourage you to do first and foremost is go to our website, striveleadershipdevelopment.com. And on the website, you can from there take our performance motivator quiz, our self-assessment. When you take the assessment for yourself, you're going to get the results for you and you're also going to get an explanation of what all of them are. So everything I'm going to tell you today in this podcast, you can get emailed to you as soon as you go on the website and you take the self-assessment. And so once you receive the description of all six of them, I would love for you to try to guess, to try to predict who, what the performance motivators are of each of the members of your team. And I think you'll be surprised. You may get a lot of them right. You may get all of them right. But from there, you can forward that link out to each member of your team. And from there, each of them can take the quiz too. And what I want you to do is schedule a meeting with them for a week out. Once they've had time to take the quiz, get their results, read it, understand it. I want you to have a meeting on schedule with them. And I want you to have tried to guess ahead of time which one they are, which performance motivator they are. And when you meet with them, I want you to ask them those questions and find out which performance motivator are they? And you might be right, they might match up perfectly, but guaranteed no matter what, the conversation that you will have with your employee after they take this assessment will be very insightful. You will gain a new understanding about this person, what motivates them, why they do what they do, what keeps them satisfied and happy, what makes them want to stay, what will make them want to tell their friends if you ever needed another person, another body in there, who this person is going to refer future people to you and why. What you will gain in that meeting with them will be so amazing. And the loyalty of following and the morale that you will have built just from going through this process is already going to put you on the map at a new level of management style and a new level of leadership. I do lots of work that takes a lot of time to put into place, meaning creating new habits. And over time, you're going to start to see the fruits of your labor. This is not one of those things. This is one of those things that you can act on and take, take a, um, an action toward today, right now, that tomorrow will have an impact. It will have an impact on you and it will have an impact on your team. And one week from now, when you have those conversations with your team about it, you will have taken your, the morale of your team, the culture of your environment up to a new level because your leadership style will have risen to a new level just by going through this process. So that's the true real value here. And it's such a great conversation to have with your people because you will know how to create those conversations for the future too, as people's performance motivators change through the seasons of their lives changing. And that is really key. That's probably the biggest difference between personality tests, which I love, by the way, I think personality tests are amazing. I also think and believe strongly in strengths finders tests. I think all of those 
assessments of self are invaluable, just priceless. You need as much information as you can and as much insight as you can about yourself to make these kinds of decisions. This is yet another layer to incorporate within it. It is not to replace any of them and all of them can stand on their own. But put together, it gives you such a great picture and such a great opportunity to make decisions and move in directions that you think are positive toward where you want to go and what you want to create. So let's dive into this a little bit. Again, it's never about the money. So what are the deal breakers? That's what I, that's kind of the key point here. What's the deal breaker? What's the thing that would either, they could either have or lack having that would be the deal breaker for you that would make you say, no, it's off. It's done. I, I'm not in, or I'm definitely in, right? That's what I'm asking for. Money's the same. What's your deal breaker? So I want to share a story with you. Um, first, the first story I want to share with you is the impact player. And that is one of the six performance motivators. There's six different ones. None of them are better than another. There is not one that is right and one is wrong. There is no varying degree of rightness, wrongness, better, worse, all of that. No, it doesn't exist. That isn't even possible. It's like saying, saying a personality trait or a strength is one's better than another. It's not, none of them are. They all have value and they all, it's, it's about understanding, okay? So having said that, I also want you to keep in mind that we all may have a little bit of all of them in us. So don't be surprised if you can kind of relate to and connect with all of them, which is why it's really important to ask great questions, take the assessment, even evaluate the assessment, because that's only as good as the answers you gave, which again are very emotional ones. So it's really important to realize that you asking those questions in deep and diving deep is more important than anything else because odds are good. There's a little bit of all six of these in you to some degree. But my first story I want to share with you is my impact player. His name is Kent, and I like to call him Clark Kent because I believe that he is Superman. Behind it all, underneath it all, that's where he is. Now, the reason I'm sharing you this story is I'm walking into work one day, I'm doing my normal thing, I'm hanging out with the group, I'm saying hi to different people in their offices, checking in with this one, how was the soccer game last night, having just you know regular conversation, just like I do any morning when I'm walking through the office. I end up in the kitchen where there's always a little collection of a few people. That's always fun to catch up with everybody, see what's happening, listening to an, a story or a funny little antic from someone or what's happening with somebody's life. And everybody's getting their coffee and dropping off their lunch for the day in the fridge. And so it's a good, you know, water cooler talk discussion. And Kent is in there while I'm in there and he's getting his coffee and he seems a little bit rushed, but he also seems a little off, like something's bothering him. And I kind of, other than the normal good mornings and, and hellos and all of the, the, the niceties, for the most part, I, I kind of brushed that off and continued with the day. And I'm in my office and I'm going through all of my reports from some of the projects that we're working on. And Kent had sent me some reports to go through. So I was going through those. And um, I had a couple questions on the report. So I walked into Kent's office to see if he's available for some questions and answers. And he's there and he's like, yes, come on in. So I go in, sit down with him and Kent is still acting a little odd and I can't figure out why, I can't put my finger on it. And finally he asks me, how was the meeting that you had yesterday? And I said, oh yeah, the meeting, we, th that was a meeting we had with corporate. I said it was a very premature planning meeting for business plan next year. And um, since it was preliminary, we're gonna have another one next week. Okay, great, he says. I was just wondering why I wasn't included on the meeting, he said. And I said, oh, it didn't even occur to me. I said, I knew that you were involved in a really big project of ours, probably one of the biggest, one of the most important projects that we have put together in a really long time. And financially, it did require, he was our CFO, um, as a CFO, it's required of him to really look at strategy and really put some creativity in the numbers and come up with a lot of different ways to um, maneuver those numbers to make sure that we can come up with a project that works. So that was a big project that he had been working on. And that's what I said to him. I said, Kent, I actually didn't even consider it because you were so wrapped up in this very important project and it, it wouldn't have even occurred to me to pull you off of that project. 
to have you in this preliminary meeting that wasn't nearly as important. And he said, well, actually, it really did bother me. I really thought I needed to be in that meeting. And I was taken aback. And I, what I realized there, and what I'm sure you may be seeing too, and this is obviously years later, it's easy for me to look back, is, well, could I have done better, right? Like I could have communicated differently. There could have been a better understanding between us. I thought I was doing him a favor by not including him and not even communicating about it because I knew he was very focused on this particular project. And what I realized in that moment is I had a memory of a position that he had where we worked together in a, in a previous company, in a previous situation. And when he um, worked at that position in that job, I remember that the reason he was frustrated most of the time and the reason he ultimately left that company is because they didn't value him enough in the strategic planning meetings that he really brought a lot to the table to contribute. And in that moment, I realized that this is a person, and this is where this concept started to come together for me. This is a person who, if they don't have that in their position, they're not gonna be happy. They will not feel satisfied. Kent is never going to take a position with a company where he is not at the helm, or at least right next to the helm, where he's part of the strategic planning, bringing his impact, being a player in the, in the ring, he wants to bring what he has. And if two positions came available at the same time, he will never pick the one where he's not in that position. That's when I first learned and realized that it's never about the money. And this is a CFO who cares a lot about money, right? CFOs care about money. That's important to them. So we're not saying money's not important. We're saying it's never the decision maker. It's never the deal breaker within reason, everybody, right? So that kind of gives you kind of an, a good story to open up what a, an impact player is, okay? The impact player, they want to bring their value. They wanna know they're being seen, recognized and valued for the critical pieces that affect the direction of the company, their, the purpose, their purpose in all of that. And they need to be included if they're going to feel valued. That's an impact player. Now a change champion, that's our next one. I love a change champion. There are so many amazing change champions out there and many of them are very high level leaders. You and I both know many of them who have a purpose greater than all other things, either for mankind, the world, the earth, the planet, different cultures, different religions, you name it, they are in it for the purpose. And I'm thinking a lot of you can relate to this, but my daughter right now is in the mode and in the season of her life where she wants to work for a company where she believes in the cause. She may or may not even like the day-to-day -day tasks that she is responsible for doing, and sometimes she doesn't. But what's more important to her is that she chooses a company that has a mission and a purpose that she believes in. Like, what am I working toward here? What is the impact I'm even making? Are we getting anywhere? She wants to be part of the cause. And if faced with the decision, she's always going to pick the company that has the cause. She wants to believe in the purpose. She wants to know that she's contributing to that, making an impact. And she wants to get behind everything the company stands for with that purpose in mind. Because it's never about just the money. It's never about the money. The third one is a success seeker. And depending on what you do in your world, you've probably met a lot of success seekers in, in your life. And what's interesting about a success seeker is that many times they grow out of it. Many times that doesn't stay with them forever. Some of these do and can stay with you forever. But one of this is one where I see, at least in my perspective and what I've seen in my uh, world and the people I surround myself with, just like myself, a success seeker is ambitious. They want to achieve a lot. They're looking for the development and the advancement opportunities. It's not really about what the work is so much. It may not even be what their title or responsibilities are. They just want to know that there's a path to getting to the next point, to the next level. Whatever they've defined as achievement and success, they want to make sure they're on that path moving through that process and working their way up. They're always going to choose the opportunity 
that shows them that path. Even if the money isn't great right now, most of the time, this is the person who will give up some of the money now, knowing that they're in the place where they will get the money later, right? So this is the kind of thing where for me personally, I was a success seeker for most of my life. And a little bit of that will always linger within me. It's always going to stay. However, I shifted later through a different season of my life. I emotionally have different things that I want to have satisfied. And the success seeker doesn't necessarily fulfill that completely anymore. It's not the number one driver. Now, does that mean I still don't love success and I don't, and I'm not an achiever? No, absolutely not. What I'm saying is I have made a switch now and I'm in a new position now of what truly does motivate me. So the opportunity is always there, but a success seeker is looking for the path, looking for the development opportunity. What is next? How can I achieve more and how can I get there? And they mostly do want to be recognized along the way for that because they want to make sure that they are seen so that it opens up all the doors and possibilities for them. Now, the next one is our boundary balancer. And interestingly enough, that's where I've moved into in my life. So from success seeker to boundary balancer, and it's not much different than um, Monica. Monica is was a lawyer. Well, she still is a lawyer, right? Once you're a lawyer, you're a lawyer unless you don't have your license anymore. And she still to this day is a lawyer. And what happened is she was a client of mine and she ended up going part-time at her firm. She had children, she had a family, she had other things in her life where they took her time and her energy and she wanted to give that time and energy to them. But she's still a lawyer and she's still strong and she still has so much other, so much to bring to the table and it's important to her to continue to contribute and use that and give back in those ways. So she went part-time at her firm. She actually doesn't even need the money. She's not doing it for the money. She's doing it because she has a contribution. She has a lot that she can contribute and she wants to do that for herself and her own fulfillment while also being able to balance the other important things in her life. She needs to leave at three o'clock every day to go pick up her children. If her kids are sick, she's the one staying home with them. If there's any kind of you know, school function or thing that needs to be done, it's her and she wants it to be her and she's in the position to, but she also doesn't want to limit herself from bringing everything she can from a quality standpoint to her firm and her firm appreciates that too. And that's what I want to offer you with a boundary balancer because I've had many of them who have worked for me along the way. When they are high quality people who bring a lot to the table, they're usually really good at figuring out how to do that really efficiently and effectively while balancing everything else in their lives. And if you're willing and the business is able to make those compromises and sacrifices to accommodate that, you can usually benefit tremendously as a result. That's the boundary balancer, my friends, and they're incredible additions to your organization if you can make that work for them. Now, the tribe thinker. I love a tribe thinker. Let me tell you about one of my favorites. His name is Boomerang Bob. Yep, we named him Boomerang Bob um, for good reason, and I'll tell you more about him. So Boomerang Bob, he didn't start out as Boomerang Bob, as you can imagine. He started out as Bob. He was a great project manager for us. He would go about his day to day. We believed that he was a success seeker. He was always looking for the next thing. He wanted the, he wanted to go to the next level. He just wasn't ready yet. And very fortunately for Bob, he is surrounded by a lot of other project managers who are really, really strong and could help him and support him and give him what he needs to be successful in the current position and where he wanted to go. Well, what happened is one day, I'm assuming, another company attracted Bob and lured Bob over to come work for them. And he did, he left. He left because he was given a title that was a little bit fancier than the one he had with us. And that's what he thought he had wanted for so long. So Bob left. The problem was he didn't have 
any people around him anymore to support him, to, to be a resource for him, to help him, to educate him, to give him what he was looking for to keep him motivated to the next level so that he could learn. The truth is he had a lot of potential to learn. But what happened was he realized how important his tribe was. He realized how important it was to surround yourself with people who could support you in that process of getting there and, and trust that when the time is right, your tribe is going to take care of you. Self-awareness was the big learning point with Boomerang Bob. So he's named Boomerang Bob because he called his boss, I don't know, maybe six months later. It took him a little while to learn it and asked if he could come back. Luckily, we did have a position for Bob. Bob came back. He began working hard, harder than ever, and he also learned about himself in that process. He learned what he really needed to be successful, number one, but what made him tick, what worked for him, why he loved it so much, and that was the rest of the tribe. He ended up becoming the social director, unpaid, unpaid position. He became the social director of the company where he was putting together a lot of the functions we were doing, some of the charity events we were doing, all of that. Bob thought he was a success seeker. We as managers thought he was a success seeker because that's what he portrayed to us. There's probably a lot of lessons in that. The point is the real emotional driver for him, his real performance motivator was being a tribe thinker. It's never about the money. My last one, but not least, this, this group I love are the structure whizzes. A structure whiz is somebody who really seeks their security and their limitation of risk from their job. They want job security. They just wanna know that it's gonna stay, it's tried and true, they're not gonna do anything to risk it. They're very, they want to stay in a position of responsibility do that job well, contribute what they can, go home to all the other things they have, but risk of position, security, financial, all of those are their drivers, their motivators. Okay, so Harry, for example, is was one of our, he, he's basically a, um, a purchasing manager in a department. And he loves his position, he's fantastic at what he does, brings so much to the table, and Tried and true. You can always count on him to get everything that he needs. We very rarely change much for him. He stays with it. He stays strong. And really outside of the box, he's not someone who wants to be called outside of work. He doesn't want to come in on the weekends. He wants to know that what he can count on in his schedule and for his job stays the same from here on out. Not going to rock the boat. That's what motivates him. Now, interestingly, Harry used to be a success seeker too. But over the course of the five years prior, he got married. He started doing some very significant mission work with his church and his mother-in-law who was disabled moved in with them, he and his wife. A huge undertaking for him. Emotionally for him, all that began to matter was the financial responsibility to know that he could count on his paycheck to know that no matter what, he could, he could um, sleep well at night knowing that he's got what he needs to take care of those he needs to take care of and that he has the ability to now give the attention and the time to the other things that matter in his life without worry. So he's there, he's 100% responsible, he's 100% dedicated and committed and he has some other things too. So as long as he has the financial job stability in place, he doesn't need to climb. He doesn't need recognition. He's not looking for the next greatest thing. He's very satisfied and happy with where he is, Harry. So there's a lot of structure whizzes out there. You may know some, and my guess is that you have at least preliminarily identified yourself in these, as well as probably some of those in your team. And I'm telling you, this is going to be a game changer for you because think about how you're going to be having conversations with each of your team members once you have a full understanding. 
Think about if I didn't realize that Harry's motivations had changed along the way. And I was still trying to motivate him as if he was a success seeker, trying to give him more, trying to get him to go to the next level, try to give him a promotion, try to put more people underneath him when he didn't want that. If I'm not communicating to each of my people the way they the way they want to be motivated, then I'm actually working against myself. I'm actually causing more damage. And many times people don't realize that their emotional need has changed, that their performance motiva motivator has changed. And if they do, they're usually not talking about it at work. But this is a way to communicate in a way that allows everyone to understand, hey, I'm not a success seeker anymore. I'm very satisfied being in structure whiz or boundary balancer, or guess what? Tribe thinking is where I am, I am right now, or I'm really about being a change champion at this stage of my life. Like people will change through the seasons of their life. And that is the whole entire point of this premise. So what I need you to do is go to striveleadershipdevelopment.com, look for the performance motivator quiz, take the quiz, get your results, forward the link to your team members. Now, I dive into this at a much greater level in our coursework in Strive. So check out how to join Strive and come into our community as well, because then you need to know how to go from here. What else do we do to, to really truly create an amazing culture and, a, and an amazing team that goes after your goals? This is one step that you can put into place that will change everything immediately for you. So go put this into action for yourself, everybody, and watch for more information on that once you do, because I'm going to give you lots of great ways of how to motivate your people once you are um, in the quiz, once you've taken the quiz and you have forwarded it to everybody else. So thanks for being here, everybody. Remember, it's never about the money. It is all about the performance motivator. Go find yours. Go help your team find theirs and go create an amazing culture and be an amazing leader. I will see you very soon. Strive Leadership Development guides leaders toward their greatest potential. We hope you'll check out what we've been up to at striveleadershipdevelopment.com.